Welcome to the fourth episode of our Let's Talk About podcast series, the LuxTMA audio channel for high-level insights and updates. I'm Vanessa Melan, partner at EY, leading our EHD solutions. And today we have four special guests who will be joining us to discuss sustainable finance. More specifically, focusing on SFDR, the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation, in force since March 2021, but with recent market and regulatory evolutions. And we will discuss also the outlook of this regulation. I'm here with Pete Dostert, Transaction Executive at ANO Sherman, Isabel He Jensen, partner at BSP, Thomas Tomasic, Senior Associate at Deschert Luxembourg LLP, and Laura Archange, Counsel at Arendt and Medanach. So, to start with, Isabel, setting the scene, could you please give us a short recap on SFDR? Yes, sure. The Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation is one part of the European Commission Sustainable Finance Framework. When referring to SFDR, one would commonly also include the taxonomy regulation that entered into force in July 2020. So the EU taxonomy allows financial and non-financial companies to share a common definition of economic activities that can be considered environmentally sustainable. The Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation aims to help investors by providing more transparency on the degree to which financial products consider environmental and or social characteristics invest in sustainable investments or have sustainable objectives. It imposes all financial market participants, among which we have the asset managers such as Usage Van Co and IFMs, to disclose a certain number of information both at manager level and product level in order to avoid greenwashing. Financial market participants would then have to disclose information accordingly depending on whether the fund they manage is an Article 6, 8 or 9 fund under SFDR. The SFDR was completed by the Commission Delegated Regulation containing regulatory technical standards that entered into force in April 2022. The difficulties in applying this piece of regulation was that SFDR RTS was published at a later stage, making practical application much more difficult. The year 2022 can be remembered from a regulatory perspective as the year with a tremendous number of clarifications, briefings, Q&As, consultation at the European level, but also at the national level, such as Q&A from the CSSF. We continue now to see that the regulatory framework in relation to sustainable finance continues to further be enhanced and progressively improved. Thank you, Isabel. Turning now to Laura, can you share a little bit how financial market participants reacted to the entry into force and implementation of the SFDR? Yeah, sure, Vanessa. And so the good news is that we know precisely how financial market participants reacted to the implementation of SFDR, given that back in September 2023, the European Commission launched a comprehensive assessment of SFDR. And a summary of the feedback has been published last month. So more than 300 participants took part in the consultation, including more than 200 firms from the insurance, asset management and banking sectors. To start with a positive note, the summary prepared by the European Commission reveals that market participants are generally supportive of the SFDR policy goals. They consider that it strengthens transparency through sustainability-related disclosure in the financial services sector and acknowledge that opting for a disclosure framework at EU level was more effective and efficient than if national measures had been taken at member state level. That was for the general positive notes, but the participants also pointed out the shortcomings of the regulation. Respondents have mixed views on how the implementation of the SFDR delivered against its specific objectives. Four main critics have been expressed. First, disclosure required by the SFDR are not considered as being sufficiently useful to investors. More precisely, almost the majority of respondents think that SFDR product disclosures are insufficiently useful and comparable to allow distributors to assess investors' sustainability preferences as required under MIFID II. Second, misalignment and inconsistencies between SFDR and the rest of the sustainable finance framework 
pose challenges for both financial market participants and investors. The perfect illustration are the definition of sustainable investment in SFDR versus the definition of environmentally sustainable in the EU taxonomy. Third, some of the SFDR requirements and concepts, such as sustainable investment, are not sufficiently clear. Finally, data gaps are making it challenging for financial market participants and financial advisors to cope with the SFDR legal requirements. This last point is also relevant to various regulations of the sustainable framework, and it's not really specific to SFDR. It's worth also noting, Vanessa, but we will come back later to, on that topic, that the market players consider the integration of transition finance within SFDR as a top priority. Thank you, Laura. Um, Thomas, how does the SFDR impact capital markets players, especially those involved in securitization activities? And what are maybe more the indirect effects and related regulatory considerations for those entities? Uh, thank you, Vanessa, for the question. <clears throat> As mentioned by Isabel and Laura, SFDR primarily targets financial market participants and financial advisors, such as asset managers, institutional investors, and insurance companies, mandating them to disclose how they integrate sustainability risks and factors into their investment processes. However, its direct applicability to capital market players, such as originators, sponsors, and special purposes entity involved in securitization, is more nuanced. Indeed, these entities are not explicitly covered by the scope of this regulation, but they may still be indirectly affected by it. For instance, asset manager and institutional investors who invest in securitized products must comply with the SFDI requirement, which could drive them to demand for greater transparency and ESG integration from the securitization entities. Consequently, securitization players might voluntarily adopt similar disclosure practices to meet investors' expectations and remain competitive. Additionally, other related regulations, such as the EU taxonomy regulation, which in accordance with the provision of its Article 3 applies to corporate bonds, may impose sustainability-related disclosure obligation that indirectly impact securitization activities, or the Non-Financial Reporting Directive, which requires large public interest entities with over 500 employees to disclose non-financial information, including those relating to environmental, social, and governance factors, can also indirectly affect capital market players. Another relevant aspect of the sustainable finance landscape for capital market players, worth quickly mentioning, is green bonds. While the EU green bond standard is voluntary, adherence to this standard aims to facilitate the transition to a sustainable economy by, for instance, as it is only one of the features requiring that the proceeds of such bonds are exclusively allocated to projects that define environmentally sustainable economic activities. Therefore, while SFDR does not directly apply to capital market players involved in securitization, the broader regulatory landscape encourages these players to consider ESG factor and enhance their sustainability disclosures. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, Pete, I understand we just heard that uh, SFDR doesn't exactly cover securitization as such. Still, what is it that the Luxembourg capital market players can and should take away from it? As you may be aware, currently the only ESG disclosure requirement for securitization transactions comes from the EU securitization regulation and requires the provision of certain performance metrics, when available, in respect of residential loans or auto loans or leases for simple, transparent and standardized securitization transactions. However, on March 5, 2024, the European Commission adopted a delegated regulation entering into force on 8 July 2024 that will supplement the EU securitization regulation with regulatory technical standards, or RTSs, for STS non-asset-backed commercial paper traditional securitization transactions and STS on-balance sheets securitization transactions. This delegated regulation specifies three things. The content, the methodologies, and presentation of information related to principal adverse impacts indicators. These PAI indicators are essentially a metric from SFDR to better display negative impacts investments have on various sustainability factors and cover all investment decisions, including investments made into securitization transactions. The goal of the introduction of the 
RTSs is to standardize the type of presentation of information an originator may decide to make available as these are disclosed on a voluntary basis to enable investors to make informed decisions on the sustainability factors of their investments. And although a securitization transaction won't qualify under Article 2 of SFDR as a financial product and therefore SFDR won't apply directly to capital markets players, securitization transactions may indirectly be subject to SFDR through entity-level disclosure requirements for financial market participants investing in securitization positions. Originators of STS securitization transactions disclosing PAI indicators will be using reporting standards broadly aligned with SFDR. This means that in-scope originators will now have two options under the RTS voluntary disclosure regime. Either comply with the EU securitization regulation requirements from Articles 22.4 and 26.d.4 or alternative disclosure requirements from the RTSs. The categories of securitization transactions falling under this disclosure regime may be limited for the time being, but it can be considered a step in the right direction. Thank you, Pete. Uh, Isabel, back to you. What is to be expected next from a European level and, of course, from our local regulator? Yes, thank you, Vanessa. Taking first our local regulator, we have the CSSF that issued a communique in March this year, where it clearly sets its priority in the area of sustainable finance. While the regulatory framework is still improving, the CSSF will continue implementing its risk-based approach to supervision. So supervised entities, the board members, are responsible to ensure the integration of ESG factors in traditional governance, risk management and compliance tools. The CSSF will also continue to focus on points such as transparency and disclosures, risk management and governance. This with on-site inspections specifically focused on climate-related and environmental risks. In July 2024, ESMA will launch a common supervisory action focused on the integration of sustainability in firms' suitability assessment and product governance processes and procedures, with on-site inspections as well of a sample of credit institution and investment firms. The CSSF will keep conducting MIFID on-site inspections. On the asset management industry side, the CSSF will continue to monitor investment fund managers' compliance with SFDR, SFDR RTS and the taxonomy regulation notably as regards the organizational arrangements of the EFM, taking sustainability risk into account, but also in terms of human resources and governance, investment decision and advice. A verification of the compliance by the EFM with the pre-contractual and periodic disclosures will also be done, including marketing materials, website disclosures, but also portfolio analysis. The CSSF reiterates again its full cooperation with the relevant European and international bodies to ensure consistency in the area of international disclosures. Laura, would you like to complement on this and uh, the ESMA final report on guidelines on fund naming? Yes, of course, Vanessa. And so uh, recently the ESMA published its final reports on the guidelines on fund naming, which means that market players will have to be even more cautious, more careful when they brand their products. So with all the reports that have been published recently by the various European authorities, especially on greenwashing, this is a requirement that we were expecting, but now it's going to be uh, set in, in the guidelines of the ESMA. So in a nutshell, investment fund using the words transition, social, environmental, impact and governance will have to meet at least two conditions. So first, they need to meet a 80% threshold linked to the proportion of investments used to meet environmental or social characteristic or sustainable investment objectives in accordance with the binding element of their investment strategy. Secondly, they need to exclude investments in company involved in any activity related to controversial weapons. They need also to exclude companies involved in the cultivation and production of tobacco. And third, they need to exclude companies that benchmark administrator find in violation of the United Nations Global Compact principle of the OECD guidelines. In addition to these two requirements, investment funds using sustainability-related terms in their branding should also commit to invest meaningfully in sustainable investment as per the meaning of SFDR. Thank you, Laura. Isabel, can I ask you to speak about the ESA's opinion regarding the assessment of SFDR? 
Yes, of course. So ESA recommends a product classification system based on regulatory categories and or sustainability indicators. So for Article 8 and 9 funds under SFDR, they have been used as sustainability labels by the FMPs and understood as labels by investors. Now ESA wants to propose the introduction of categories of products that have sustainability features. They should consist of minimum criteria and not labels of excellence of best-in-class products. One category is the sustainable product category, the other, the transition product category. The first one would include products that invest in economic activities that are already environmentally and or socially sustainable. Sustainable products should comply with a minimum sustainability threshold. For environmentally sustainable products, such a threshold could be based or should be based on investment in taxonomy-aligned economic activities. The second category would cover products that invest in economic activities that are not yet sustainable, but which will improve with over time to become environmentally or socially sustainable. Investment strategies of such products could build on a mix of EU taxonomy KPIs to reflect the progressive improvement of the environmental performance. Transparency obligations for transition products should provide investors with clarity on the level of ambition and performance. Financial products not qualifying for any of the categories I just mentioned could be divided into financial products that have sustainability features and those who have none. Common to all financial products, regardless into which category they fall, is that they will still continue to disclose under Article 6.1 SFDR covering how sustainability risks are integrated into investment decisions. Nora, would you like to detail also the aspect relating to sustainability indicators? Yes, so in addition to the product classification mentioned by Isabel, the opinion also recommends the introduction of a concept of sustainability indicator. So what does that mean? Uh, one example of an existing indicator is uh, found in the PREPS kids uh, regulation. So it's a synthetic risk indicator giving retail investors notably a simple guide to the risk of the product. So here the idea would be similar. It stems from the fact that consumers, they struggle to understand the different sustainability objectives of financial products and the distinction between different objectives when they read SFDR disclosures. Consumers found it difficult to grasp how sustainable products are. So such an indicator could be built in three different ways. One option could be to focus narrowly at first on a sustainability indicator measuring climate change mitigation based on financed emission, which is translated to a contribution to climate change presented in a Nutri-score-like system. Another option would be to focus on a broader indicator that would grant the base grade equally to sustainable investment and to those transition and transformational investments where the expected impact on the environment or society is significant based on a decarbonization target or a social improvement expected from the investment strategy. And the third option would be a combination of the two first options. Well, thank you very much to all of you. This was uh, very insightful and we understand that SFDR is still subject to uh, evolution. So keep watching also for the next updates on this. Stay tuned as well for our next podcast where we will explore the so-called CSRD, another acronym, so the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive. Thank you all for listening to this episode of Let's Talk About podcast. If you enjoyed today's discussion, don't forget to leave us a review and share your feedback. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast and join us for future episodes as we continue to bring you the latest insights and updates from the world of sustainable finance. Until then, keep thinking green.